was what, like a nine minute segment? Shows his parents talking and a whole lot of different background with this. But um, I am very pleased to introduce uh, Anthony Iani. Um, I, I heard about him years ago because my little brother, who's not so little, um, played basketball for Michigan State. And he kept, he knew the struggles and things that were going on with, with my son, his nephew. And he kept saying, you need to meet Anthony. Anthony Iani will give you hope. You need to meet Anthony. This is it. And so that became one of my goals, was to meet him. And I was just so blessed to be able to do that. And uh, we're very pleased to have him here. Uh, he'll tell you what, there wasn't a lot of hope. I don't know how many of y'all have sat through those meetings where somebody said, well, don't expect a huge amount from your child. And you're going, wait a minute here. Uh, how do you respond to that? Uh, his parents heard the same thing, and he'll tell you how they responded. And um, he made it all the way up to be Division I NCAA basketball player at Michigan State. And he is the first one that has been <coughs> diagnosed with autism that has competed at that level. So with that, did I get it all? You can tell everything <laughs> else. So with that, um, I am very pleased to introduce Anthony. Anthony. Do you want me to get rid of that or leave that no, up you can there? Get it up. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And then I think you have to turn that back on because they don't want it. You guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't be uh, doing my job if I uh, didn't say howdy. This howdy. howdy. So um, this is not my second time here at this conference and my second time in the College Station area, so I'm very happy and honored to be back here. Uh, I keep telling Lucinda I need to come back every year because I've fallen in love with the area, fall in love with Texas A&M, you know, right away. So I've been converted to an Aggie. Hope you guys are <laughs> uh, Well, first and foremost, um, you heard a little bit about my background. You kind of saw in some detail about who I am. Uh, but I'll kind of give you the full detailed version of it. When I was four years old, I was diagnosed with pervasive developmental disorder. It's a type of autism. And what's really unique about my diagnosis is that was during the early 90s. And during that time period, nobody really knew what autism was. Nobody really knew a lot of the characteristics for it. There was zero awareness for it. And during that time period, it was more of the ADD, ADHD era for a diagnosis. So my diagnosis was very rare. But a year later, when I was five years old, a group of doctors and professionals told my parents these words in a private meeting. They said, sir, ma'am, because your son does have a type of autism, that basically means don't expect him to do much or be much in life. Because he's barely going to graduate from high school, he's never going to go to college, he's never going to be an athlete, but you know, eventually when he's done with high school, whenever that'll end up being, he'll end up in a group institution with other autistic kids like himself for the rest of his life. Now, I wasn't told this story until my freshman year in high school. 
So that kind of became my motivation to go out and prove those people and then the other doubters and naysayers that had my life wrong. I had to work hard at everything, from basketball to my social life and especially school, because I'm not afraid to admit this, I was not the smartest kid that went to my high school. I wasn't. I had good grades, I had some bad grades here and there, but that's because each and every single day for me was a different day with an even more difficult challenge. But I had great teachers who sacrificed and supported a lot for me to help me get through those tough days and challenges and more importantly help me become the best student that I can be. But throughout life it wasn't just teachers who always supported me. It was friends, coaches, teammates, and my family. So the rest be history. I went on to graduate from Okemos High School in 2007, where I then went on to Grand Valley State University for two years on a full ride scholarship for basketball. Now, I was only at Grand Valley State for two years because things just weren't going as well as I hoped they would. So I decided to leave Grand Valley State to fulfill my lifelong dream. And that was the dream of playing for a certain coach at a certain university. So I left Grand Valley State to go play for Coach Tom Izzo in the Michigan State Spartans, where I was a walk-on for two years. My senior year, Coach Izzo awarded me a full ride scholarship. I was a part of two Big Ten championship teams, a team that won the Big Ten tournament title, a team that went to a Final Four, and I got to play with an outstanding group of individuals who to this day I'm proud to call each of those guys my brothers. But I'm proud of two things in my life, and the first one is this. As it's mentioned up here on the uh, PowerPoint, I am the first ever Division I college basketball player in NCAA history with an autism diagnosis. And I'm very, very proud of that. But I think I'm even more proud of the fact that I graduated and got my bachelor's degree in sociology from Michigan State University. So throughout my life, folks, I've overcome challenges and obstacles that were greater and bigger than myself. And a lot of those challenges and obstacles, they were definitely twice as big and twice as tall as I'll ever be in my entire lifetime. And I'm six foot nine on a size 18 shoe. <laughs> So, but a lot of people ask me the question whenever I meet people all over the country is, well, it's a, it's a wonderful story, but let's be honest. There, there's no way you just got to this point, you know, from your diagnosis to getting here within a snap of a finger. Like, there's no way that happened. Like, how did you get to this point? Like, what, what support services did you have? Like, what, what was your motivation? Like, how did you get here? And I tell people all the time, I got here through three, through three very simple ways, just three ways because they're called the three keys to success in life. Because I've always guaranteed everybody that if you follow these three keys for the rest of your life, not only will you go far in life and do what you'd love to do, but I promise and guarantee that these three keys will help you become better as a person. Now the first key is motivation. Because each and every single day, whenever I woke up, I had a mindset. It was the mindset of, all right, who's gonna doubt me today? Who's gonna tell me I can't do this, I won't do that because it's impossible or it just can't be done? And I tell people all the time, I didn't mind being doubted every single day of my life. I didn't mind it for one second. As a matter of fact, to this day, I still welcome every doubter and hater in my life with open arms. Because the more and more people that doubted me, the more and more motivated I became. And the more and more motivation I got to want to go out, strive for success, and make a name for myself in my life. But every time I was motivated, it didn't mean that things were just going to be handed to me, or things were going to be given to me. I had to go out, work hard, and earn everything in my life. Hard work, which is the second key. Now, my father taught me a quote. A quote that when you guys walk out of this room today, I want you to remember this quote for the rest of your life. I want you to pass it down to your kids, your grandkids, your students, your colleagues, whoever you think would benefit from this quote. Now, I'm going to share with you how powerful this quote is. In November 2012, the day before Thanksgiving, about a month and a half into my speaking career, I spoke at a middle school called Bath Middle School in Bath, Michigan. Now, Bath is about 20 minutes, about 10, 20 minutes north of my hometown, Oklahoma, Michigan. It's a very, very small town. It's about 300 total students go to the school. So two weeks later, I come home, and there was this big old package of thank you letters from all the students on my kitchen table. So I stopped what I was doing, sat down, I went through every single letter. There was one letter that stood out to me the most. Because in this letter, the student had shared some information with me I thought a student would never tell me. She had shared with me that one of her grades in one of her classes was a D-. minus. Now, I remind everybody in this room, I didn't go to Michigan State and get my degree in education. I got in sociology, which is social science. So I'm not a teacher. I'm not a counselor, I'm not a principal. So I'm sitting here going, why is this student telling me this information about grades? This is none of my business. So I was just going to put the letter away and be done with it. But I knew something good was going to come out of it. So after she had told me what one of her grades were in one of her classes, she had then shared with me that she is my father's quote for motivation and inspiration to work harder, not just in school, but to work harder out there in her life. And in two weeks, because of this quote, more importantly because of all her hard work, that D minus grade <coughs> went to a solid B in two weeks. And the quote is, the harder you work, the more you earn. 
The harder you work, the more you earn. And that quote, I promise, it is as true as it can get. Because if my father taught me that quote, that quote helped me graduate from my high school and people told me I would barely do it. That quote helped me earn two Fulbright scholarships for college basketball. People told me I would never be an athlete. That quote, in my opinion, helped me graduate from one of the toughest universities in the state of Michigan. And a group of doctors and professionals told my family not only would I never graduate from college, but I have absolutely no chance of stepping foot on a college campus anywhere in this country. And that quote helped me and my teammates in Michigan State earn two Big Ten championship rings. Now those rings, that's just proof of what hard work earned us as a team. Not as individuals, but as a team. Now let me share with you what I tell young students and young adults every day about what hard work will earn them in life. Getting good grades in school, that's what hard work earns somebody. Going through high school, getting a high school degree is what hard work earns somebody. Going to any college in this state, hopefully Texas A&M, or anywhere in the country and graduate from that college. Getting their college degree is what hard work earns them in life. Getting a job, getting paid for that job, and sustaining that job over a certain amount of time, that is what hard work earns an individual in life. Now, just because I went to Michigan State for one of the greatest basketball programs in the country, and we are the greatest, don't deny that. <laughs> Put your money on us this month, all right? We're going to win it all this year. But just because we are Michigan State didn't mean that for one second that every time we walk into somebody's gym or somebody's arena, that people were just going to get scared of us because we were Michigan State. I can tell you all for a fact that that did not happen at all. Because we had to go out every day and every night and earn everybody's respect around not only our conference, the Big Ten Conference, but around the country as well. But there was one thing, though, that we loved about each other the most in Michigan State as teammates. It wasn't how many championships we won, how many Final Fours we had gone to. It was about how much support and respect that we had for one another, no matter what. And we didn't care where our teammates came from. We didn't care. Whether it was from Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, New York, Indianapolis, it didn't matter to us. But more importantly, we did not care if our teammates were black or white, because the only thing we cared about was this. Having each other's back no matter what. Supporting each other through good times and the bad times, and more importantly, always respecting one another no matter what. Now, obviously, I graduated from Michigan State over six years ago, but you know what? Any chance I get to go back there, see my old teammates, and visit with my old coaches, I cherish every moment with them. But not just with my teammates, with all of my friends, friends from elementary school all the way to college, I cherish every second, minute, hour, day, week, month, and year with all of them. And that's what I encourage everybody in this room to do for the rest of your life. Cherish every moment, every day with friends. Because friends are going to have our back no matter what. Friends are going to support us through good times and in bad times, and more importantly, friends will always respect us no matter what. But throughout life, it's not just friends or teammates that will be there to support you. There will be other groups along the way as well, such as coaches, teachers, and family. The third and final key, in my opinion, the most important key of them all is support. Now, I have one older sister. My sister is four years older than me, and my sister was without question one of the greatest volleyball players to ever come out of the state of Michigan. Now, for those of you that know the game of volleyball or maybe have family members that or friends that played it, my sister was a setter. She played the setter position in volleyball. Now, the average height for a college volleyball setter, ladies and gentlemen, the average height is between 5'8 and 5'11. So that's pretty tall for a setter, right? My sister is 6'2". 6'2", and she dominated each and every single day she stepped on that court. And when she was in high school, she was recruited by all these great colleges. Colleges such as Stanford, UCLA, Southern Cal, Oregon, Texas, Texas A&M, Florida, Miami, Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Penn State, Nebraska, the list goes on and on and on. That's how good she was. But like any other brother sister do in life, growing up, my sister and I, we hate each other. We despised one another because I, I, I'm not afraid to admit this, I was the most annoying little brother in history. I got on my sister's nerves so much that there was one day I was at home. And now for those of you that have never been to Michigan before, put it this way. What the weather you had this week, that's what our spring is like. It could be 30 degrees and two inches of snow one day in May. Yeah, it's miserable. But this was one of those spring days where it was gorgeous outside. It was sunny, not a cloud in the sky. And it was, wind was blowing in. It's one of those days here where if you want to turn the air conditioning off and put the windows up, that's what you want to do. So that's what I did. So I opened up the window, turned my TV on, I put it on mute because I just wanted to be relaxed. I wanted to listen to the sounds of nature coming into the house. My parents were gone. They were out running errands. My sister was upstairs getting ready for packing up for college. I grabbed the Gatorade. I sat, I laid down on that couch and I said to myself, nobody's touching me today. 
Nobody's going to bother me. Nobody's going to talk to me. Mom and dad are gone. My sister's upstairs doing, you know, packing up for college. This is great. I'm living the life, living the good life. When I got done saying all that, my sister walked down the stairs, walked in the living room, shut the TV off on me. I sat up on the couch. I looked at our front closet thinking, okay, Ashton Kutcher's going to pop out right now and tell me I've been pumped on national television. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. When I came to the realization that was not going to happen, I looked at my sister and I said to her, seriously? I haven't done anything to you today. I haven't talked to you for 10 minutes. I haven't even annoyed you for two seconds. So you're going to walk down the stairs, walk into the living room like you own the place, like you pay mortgage on the house, and you're just going to turn the TV off on me like that? You're going to ruin your little brother's ba like day like that? Like seriously? And I was pulling out like the sad puppy face look on her and everything. I was pulling out all the stops. Then she turned around and looked at me and said, I swear, you have the most annoying little brother ever. I mean, Anthony, I wish I'd never lived in the same house as you because you are so annoying. I mean, you just drive me nuts each and every single day. I can't take it anymore. I say, it's a king. Now, folks, I didn't drive her nuts. I drove her crazy. Because <laughs> I made it my own personal goal each and every single day to annoy the heck out of my sister. 24 hours, 7 days a week. If I annoyed her for 24 hours a day, fantastic. I love those days. It's like I threw my own Christmas, birthday, and New Year's Eve party all in one day. That's how much fun I had with it. But... Say I failed to annoy my sister for one day, just for one day. But you know what? I st still had a good day at school, good day in basketball. Still failed to annoy her for a day. Yeah, I hated those days. I despised those days because I wasn't doing my job as an annoying little brother and just driving my sister crazy all the time. But after my sister left for college, I did something for two weeks straight I thought I would never have done. After my sister had left for college, I stayed in her room for two weeks because I missed her that much. Because it took me 14 years of my life to finally realize how important my only sibling is to me. And during that time, it was a really tough and scary time for me too, because I was starting off as a freshman at my high school. And as a freshman, I was six foot six, I wore a size 16 shoe, and I kid you not, I was scared of guys in my high school who weren't even taller than the podium here. <laughs> the reason was because they were the football players, really big muscular guys. Me, well, see the microphone stand here? That's, this is me in high school, right here. Now. Definitely a little bit taller than this, not a doubt much more handsome than this in school, but I really wasn't this skinny. But I was a skinny kid because I did not lift weights or touch a weight till I was a junior in high school. And I thought the football players were going to beat me up every day because I was so skinny and they were so big and muscular. Luckily though, they didn't. I actually became good friends with a few of those guys. But you know what, all the good fun I had that year, all the great memories and moments I made, I never got one chance to share those times with my sister. Because she started off in college in California. 3,000 miles away from me. Never been that far apart from my sister in my entire lifetime. It was really tough for me. It was difficult. But when she came back home, finished her volleyball career at Michigan State, we became closer than ever after that. We basically became best friends. We did a lot of things together. We did things like go to the movies, go to the mall. On the weekend, I went over to her apartment to watch college football, college basketball games. Where my sister and I, we would just sit down at our parents' dinner table for two, three hours straight and just talk about life. Because my sister was a big expert in that life. We went through a lot of the same things together. For example, we were both college athletes. For those of you that don't know this, college athletes, they live two lives. Student and athlete. And we had to balance both those lives out because if one life took over the other, it was a guarantee that neither me or my sister, we weren't going to make it as college athletes. And you know what? The same rules apply for a regular college student too. You got your school life, you got your job life, you got to balance it out. Because if one life takes over the other, it's a guarantee that that individual will not make it through college. A lot of us have been there before. That's the game of college. Those are the rules of college. You've got to balance your life out and prepare yourself for the real world. Now, my sister taught me all that. She taught me how to get through the really tough days of being an athlete in Michigan State. Taught me how to get through the even harder days of being a student in Michigan State because of all her experiences and everything that she went through. All the days I doubted myself, all the days I questioned whether or not I could make it as a student athlete at Michigan State, who picked me up every day? Who kept telling me, Anthony, you can do this, you will do this, because if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. Who kept picking me up every day? It was my sister. My sister, to this day, is still protective of me. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I said and did things that were really out of the ordinary, which I'll get into momentarily, but her friends saw that. And her own friends started bullying me and picking on me because they didn't quite understand me at the time. So what did my sister do? She protected me from her friends. She protected me. When I was at Michigan State, 
Same deal. I've, I've gone on record saying I think Michigan State has one of the best fan bases ever. But you know what? Like any other fan base in college athletics, if you lose a certain game you're not supposed to lose, the fan base is going to blame somebody who had zero impact on the game. So we had lost to Northwestern on the road. I'm coming home. On, we're coming home on the bus. And my sister called me and said, hey, do you hear what the fans are saying about you? Like, you know, I can't take this anymore, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I was like, I, I said, sis, time out. Shush. Okay? Like, here's the deal. You let me worry about the fans, okay? Because that means I'm not going to worry about it. They say whatever the heck they want, okay? You worry about being my number one fan, all right? You worry about that. And you don't have to protect me on this one, okay? You don't need to protect me all the time. I'm 23 years old. I'm a grown man in college. I got this. You're good. But after I said that, I realized something. It doesn't matter where I go in my life. It doesn't matter what I do. She's always going to be there to protect me no matter what. Because of everything that I still do and that I say these days. And some people may not understand it. Because that's everything that she and I have gone through. We've been through a heck of a lot more than that. More than I haven't even shared yet. Because it's a lot. So it's, it's a lot of stuff that will be in my book one day for sure. But the point I'm making here is this. It doesn't matter how annoying your brothers and sisters are to you. Quite frankly, I don't care how annoying you are to them. Because at the end of the day, you're family. You have each other for the rest of your life, and just like all your friends, you cherish every moment, every day, with family. And that's why to this day I thank God for my parents each and every single day. Because what my parents have done for me, what they have sacrificed for me, they helped raise me, helped me become the man and the person that I am today. All the late nights of staying up with me till the wee hours in the morning, helping me with my homework. All the late nights of staying up with me till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, keeping me positive because I had such a bad day from school previously because I was so, I was bullied, teased, and disrespected a lot by my other peers and classmates. It was a lot for me. And I questioned whether or not I was going to go the next day. They kept me positive. The day my parents, ladies and gentlemen, were told my quote-unquote future, here's what happened. The doctors and experts gave their opinions, their analysis. Once they got to the third person, my dad cut the person off. They said, I, I understand what you're doing, I respect your profession, but let me tell you what our plan is. Our son's going to graduate from high school. Somehow, some way, he's going to go to college. And if he's, a, if he's an athlete doing all this, great, cool. God's going to bless him with those gifts. But guess what? He doesn't have to be a college athlete to get his degree now. So he's going to graduate from college, and he's going to prove each and every single one of you wrong. You watch. And my dad told me that. I said, well, what do those experts and doctors think about you after that? He said, well, I'm pretty sure they probably thought I was on drugs that day. <laughs> but I said to my dad, I said, probably, but you know what? Who's laughing now, right? He goes, you know what, son? Yeah. You're darn right. But the day that stuff was happening, my parents' expectations never changed. Never changed. Kept them up here. Oh, he's barely going to graduate from high school. Okay, we're keeping it up here. Oh, he's never going to go to college. Okay, we're going to keep it up here. Oh, he's going to end up in a group institution. Okay, we're going to keep it up here. <coughs> What else do you want to tell us? Our expectations aren't going to change because that's what, that's what our plan is. We're going to keep them here. Not here, not here, up here. Not here, here. And they didn't change it because they knew that if they advocated for me, if they pushed for me in the school system, we were going to be successful. That is exactly what happened. My parents pushed and pushed and pushed Oklahoma's public schools every day to make sure that everything was followed in my IEP plan to the T. If something worked, you stick with it. If something didn't work, we're going to find a new route. Okay, we'll find a new way. And if that new way works, stick with it. Push and push and push. My parents were probably the most patient individuals I've ever met. And there's no such thing as a patient person in the world today. That's a fact. But did I push my parents to the point where they were going to lose their patience? Yeah, but you know what? It didn't happen. Because they knew that, you know what? At the end of the day, we, we, if we're patient, things will work out. Did I push them? Yes. But you know what? They never changed. They stayed who they are and continue to be who they are today. But were there times I looked at my family and said to them, I can't do it because it's impossible. It just can't be done. Or something like this over here, it'll never happen to me in my life. Did I actually say, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry, but I quit? Did I say that? Yeah, just one time. That's it, just one time. But after I said the words, I quit, my parents refused to let those words ever come out of my mouth ever again. Because my parents have always taught me that words like that should never exist in the dictionary because they're so negative. They're so negative that when we say to other people in life, it immediately brings that person down for a long, long time. My parents told me to do one thing before I went to sleep every night. That was just to look at myself in a mirror and ask myself questions. Questions like, did I give it my all today? 
Did I give 100% effort in all my classes in school today? Did I leave all my heart, passion, energy, all my effort on the basketball court today? And you know, if I wasn't satisfied with how I was doing one day, okay, fine. I was going to try and go back the next day and give 110%. If I still wasn't satisfied, okay, fine. I'm going to go back tomorrow and give 120%. But if I still wasn't satisfied, you know what? I just kept pushing and pushing. Because my parents have told me and taught me all those things in my life. Because they didn't want me to wake up every day and have regrets. That's what my parents tell me the most in my life, is to never have regrets. Because if we have regrets in life, folks, I promise, I guarantee you that those regrets, they will eat at us each and every single day, and we will be brought down for the rest of our lives filled with regret. So no regrets in life. Now, I'm married, I've been happily married for over five years, so I'm a proud husband. More importantly, my wife and I, we are proud parents to two beautiful, healthy baby boys. My oldest son, Knox, who is four, and my youngest son, Nash, who just turned one not long ago. Um, unfortunately, he's got a double ear infection right now and also has um, a little breathing uh, issue right now. But he's doing good though. I just FaceTimed him. Fever's gone down. He's going to be fine when I get home. He's a happy boy right now. That's the important thing. And you know what, folks? Those were two other things that people told me I would never do. Never have a family, never get married, never have kids. Well, okay, I can check those few things off. What are you going to tell me I can't do now? You know, I've always told people I love challenges. Because why do I love challenges so much? Because I've been challenged for 30 years of my life. And I've always dared somebody to put a loss in that column because I'm undefeated against challenges. I love doing that. But you know what? The point here is this. Just because I'm a husband and I'm a father doesn't change one thing for me. The same goes for everybody in this room. You're all going to be faced with decisions in life. Decisions that are going to put so much pressure on all of us that sometimes we want to walk away from those tough times. Walk away from those decisions, but not me. I'll tell you where I go. I go to my family. Because everybody in my family has been through tougher times, has made tougher decisions than I will ever make in my entire lifetime. Because folks, whatever I say or do out here in public, whatever I say or do, it doesn't just impact me, it most impacts my entire family. Because believe it or not, the decisions that we all make in our lives, it doesn't just impact each and every single person. In this room, in your town, at your work, it impacts each and every single person that you all love in life. Now for me, that's my wife. That's my sons. My whole family. Because my words, my actions, and my decisions, it's going to weigh on my family the most. But you know something? If I'm caught in a tough spot, if i got a big decision coming up and I have no clue where I'm going to go with it, I'm not afraid to go to my mom or my dad at 30 years old and look them in the eye and say, Mom, oh, Dad, this is what i got going on right now. If you guys were in my shoes, what would you do? You've been there. You've done all that. Help me out here, please. So the point I make to students, to young adults, is don't be afraid. Go to your family and ask them for help and advice and guidance in life. And I don't care how old that person is. I don't care if they're in kindergarten. I don't care if they're a freshman in high school, a senior in college. They're like me. They got a real world job. They own one of the biggest corporations in the world. It doesn't matter to me. Don't be afraid to go to family for help and advice and guidance because this, ladies and gentlemen, is the number one problem in today's generation. Today's generation doesn't want to do all that. They don't want to go the extra mile to get the help and advice and guidance they need for two reasons. Number one, they think they know everything. And number two, they just don't want to do it because they're too cool for school. Almost four years ago, I went to a high school in Michigan and presented. Um, I did a motivational speech and then I did an anti-bullying presentation. I do anti-bullying a lot around the country too, which I'll get into towards the end of my presentation. And so, toward the end, I had, a lot of, I had some students come up to me, shake my hand, ask me questions. Then there was one student left. Shook my hand, said, Mr. Ianni, I love what you had to say today. It was great, but you were just wrong about one thing. I said, okay, well, share with me. What was I wrong about? I can correct myself. It's not a big deal. He said, well, you talked about how, you know, my generation, we don't go the extra mile for the help and advice and guidance we need because we think we know everything and we just don't want to because we're too cool for school. Well, Mr. Ianni, I do have some advice for you. My generation is right. We do know everything. I'm a grown man. I'm 18 years old. I do whatever, whatever the heck I want. I looked at him in his eyes and I respectfully said, Young man, I'm going to say this to you once and only once, all right? Son, you don't know squat. And yeah, let me tell you something right now. At 18 years old, if you knew everything in the world today, you wouldn't be here in front of me right now. You wouldn't be here in high school because you would have gotten your high school degree a long time ago. You would have gotten your bachelor's degree in college right now. You would have had your master's by now. And now you're going to go get your doctorate and your PhD at 18 years old. That's when you know everything in life. And last time I checked, you're still here. So that means you don't know everything, all right? So here's what I want you to do. Get up online. You go find my phone number somewhere. Call me up and say, Mr. Ianni, I officially know everything right now. That is the only time I'm going to let you do that. So you got some work to do now. 
Last time I checked, he graduated from high school. He's in his uh, last year of college. So I'm hoping I get a phone call from him one day saying I know everything now. <laughs> two weeks later, two weeks later, I went to Potterville High School. to spoke to a peer-to-peer -peer and links group. Now, for those of you that are here that aren't familiar with peer-to-peer uh, -peer and links, I kind of call it a big brother, big sister type of program because what it is is they link up kids with uh, students with autism or students with special needs and they pair them up with regular students. So that's why it's called links and peer-to-peer because -peer, they link up and they're, they're peers pretty much. But what's really cool about this project, what's really cool about this initiative is these individuals, they don't just link up for a year, for two years, or three years, or four years. These relationships last a lifetime. Those individuals check up on their links partner or peer partner all the time. So those friendships stay forever. And that's why I call it a big brother, big sister type of deal because that's how really what it is. Now, I spoke to 25 kids, 15 freshmen, 10 freshman students with autism. So during my presentations, folks, you know, if a student raises their hand, I usually wait to the end until questions, you know, because I'm, I'm in a rhythm, I'm in a groove, I don't want to stop and pick up where I left off. Which this young man, though, this young freshman at the time, he was 15 years old, raised his hand. I said, you know what? There's not that many people in here, so I'm going to go ahead and call on him. I couldn't resist. I said, young man, what's your question? He said, well, Mr. Andy, I don't have a question. I just have something I'd like to say. I said, you know what? Okay, go for it. You know, it's your classroom. It's your classmates. I can pick up where I left off. It's not a big deal. What do you want to say? He got up out of his chair. He walked over, hands on his hips, looked like coaches all about to give a big halftime speech. I was excited. And then he looked at his classmates, looked at me, looked at me one more time and did this. <laughs> Looked at his classmates again and goes, I want all of you in this room right here and now to know that Mr. Ianni's generation would flat out kick our generation's butt. He didn't use the word butt, though. He said another word I'm not going to say. And I looked at him like, oh my gosh, he just swore in class. What am I supposed to do right now? Like, do I tell him to sit back down? And when I looked at his teachers, his teachers had their hands over their mouths. They were trying so hard not to laugh. I go, Okay, laughter is good. Laughter is good. We're getting somewhere. Okay, we're good. So I said to him, young man, well, why, why would you think that? Why would you think my generation would kick your generation's, well, in this case, tail, if you would? He said, well, Mr. Ianni, because your generation has something my generation will never have. You're tougher than us. I'm not talking physically, like, muscular tougher. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking right here. You're mentally tougher than us. Because, Mr. Ianni, if somebody in your generation had a dream or goal in life, and they started walking toward their dreams and goals, and then from out of nowhere, somebody soccer punches that person in the face, throws them down, steps on them, kicks them up, beats them up, and says, just stop, because I'm not, because you know what, you're not going to get to your dreams and goals in life. Just stop, just give up. You know what that person in your generation does? Gets right back up, keeps walking, and out of nowhere, soccer punched again, thrown down, beat up, and that person says, quit, quit, just quit. You know what happens? That person in your generation gets right back up and tells that person, keep coming at me. I don't care if i got to go through you, over you, or under you to get to my dreams and my goals in life. I'm not going to let you stop me from doing all that. Our generation, we'll get hit in the face, knocked down, and roll up, roll up into a little ball and say, I quit. Don't want to do this anymore. It's too tough. I can't take it. Then he sat down. I was amazed by all that. That's a 15-year-old freshman with autism at the time. I was just going to walk out of the building because I didn't know how I was going to follow up with that. So I looked at him and I said, young man, I'll be completely honest with you. I'm a humbled individual. I'm a very Catholic man. I thank God every day for what he's blessed me with and what Jesus has blessed me with in my life. But you know what? I'm going to take the next 20 seconds to brag right here, right now, and you're in this classroom. You're right. My generation would kick your generation's butt flat out. It wouldn't even be close. It would be no contest, actually. But the point he was making is this. Every generation goes through something different. My parents' generation went through a heck of a lot more than what I'll ever go through in my life. My grandparents' generation went through more than what I'll ever go through. My great-grandmother lived to be 99 years old. She passed away uh, 11 years ago. She went through it all. The Great Depression, both world wars, the Vietnam, the Cold War, the assassinations of JFK, Martin Luther King, 9-11. Think about this, folks. When 9-11 happened, half of today's generation wasn't even born. Think about that. They're learning about it in books, but a lot of a majority of us in this room, we knew exactly where and when we were that day. Me at 12 years old, I was in Mr. Hopper's seventh grade history class that morning. Our, our English teacher ran through the door and said, you guys need to watch this. This is going to change your lives forever. And when we saw what was going on in New York and in Washington, we were like, everything.
everything's going to change now. I mean, God forbid that we have to have another natural disaster like that for today's generation to look at that and go, whoa. But the point is, every generation goes through something different, which is why it should be okay for those young individuals to go to their families and say, hey, what should I do? You've been there, you've done that, because you've been through a lot more than what I'll ever go through. You made tougher decisions than what I'll ever go through in life. And it doesn't matter if it's mom, dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousins, grandparents, best friends, family, it doesn't matter. Because family wants us to be the best at what we do in our lives. More importantly, families want us to be the best individuals that we can be in our lives as well. Now there's another group that will support individuals throughout their lives as well. A group that I hold a special place in my heart for, not just for all of them in my hometown, but for all of them around the country, and that's teachers. Now, I want to ask everybody in this room a question, okay? And please be 100% honest with me, okay? Please be 100% honest. I won't be offended by it. When you read a little bit about, about my background, and when I told you about my diagnosis, who quickly thought to themselves, Anthony Ianni doesn't have autism. There's no way. I don't see it. I don't recognize it. Who, who, raise your hand if you thought that, honestly. Who thought that? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. And you know what? Like I said, folks, I'm not going to be offended by it because I get criticized for this each and every single day. And I tell the folks who criticize me for it, all right, you can do two things. Number one, you can sit down with me, have coffee, have dinner, and you'll walk away from that conversation two hours later have a better, better understanding of who I am. Or you can go with option B, you could call my mother and she could fax you all the paperwork for my IEPs and my diagnosis meetings. So it's your choice. But my autism folks are very black and white. What that means is you may say something to me. I'll take it the complete opposite. Growing up, I had a tough time understanding nouns, verbs, idioms, sarcasm, and jokes. I'm better now than what I was 10 years ago. But you know what? I learned to cope with the fact I'm going to have those struggles for the rest of my life. And I'm okay with that because that's what makes me me. Um, jokes and sarcasm, still my worst to this day. My wife is sarcastic with me all the time. If I can't catch it, I'll give her like a blank stare. And she'll know what's going on. She'll say, babe, I'm just kidding. Hashtag sarcasm. It's okay. I'm just joking with you. I mean, God bless my wife, man. Like, she, she, she goes through a lot with me, for real. And she does, I mean, anytime we get into an argument or if I say something out of the ordinary, and she'll just look at me like, huh, what? Well, she'll always walk away from the conversation saying to herself, that's my husband. That's who he is. That's why I love him. Whereas any other girl I ever dated, they heard about me, wanted nothing to do with me because of it, or treated me differently. Um, idiots. If you had told the five-year-old me, the five-year-old me who could not keep focus, who probably be running laps around this building right now, if you had told the five-year-old me it's raining cats and dogs outside, a majority of us in this room knows that term means, that idiom means it's raining really hard outside. It's pouring down rain. Here's what the five-year-old me would do if you had told me that. I'm sprinting out the door, taking a sharp left turn, going down those stairs, taking a sharp right turn out the exit door downstairs, going outside, hoping a cat or dog is going to fall on my hands right there and then. My mom took it to a whole different level. We were driving by one of our big grocery stores back home in the state of Michigan called Meyer. We were at the traffic light, and I was watching Meyer because it was under construction. Now, how did I know that? Pretty simple. The trucks are out there, the construction workers, the hard hats, all the good stuff. My mom does this. Oh, Anthony, look, Myers is getting a facelift this morning. <laughs> huh? You know, Myers is getting a facelift. So I looked at Myers, looked at my mom, looked at Myers one more time, and I said to my mom, lady, you're crazy. Like, what are you talking about? Myers doesn't have eyes, ears, nose, mouth. Doesn't even have facial hair. Like, what are you talking about? She said, well, Anthony, getting a, getting a facelift means you're getting a new look. You're getting a new brand, rebranded, if you will. I looked at her and I said, you could have told me that instead of all that scientific mumbo-jumbo you just threw at me a couple seconds ago. Fire drills were my worst. I hated the noises. I hated the lights, hated the sounds. So I would cover my eyes, cover my ears. I just couldn't stand it. But here's where my teachers came into play. In my IEP plan, it specifically stated that we need to give Anthony a heads up on when fire drills are because it's too much of an overload for him. So my teacher would come to me and say, Anthony, we got fire drill at 1030 today. If you're scared, you can sit with me at my desk or I can sit with you. But whatever you need to make, you, make yourself feel comfortable so you, know, so you can walk outside and do the drill. And drill will go off. My teacher's right there with me. I'm the first in line. And they're taking me outside with the rest of the class. No problem. High school, the wiring systems, they worked on it all the time. And it could trigger the alarm at any second. My teachers, hey, the janitors are working on the wiring system today. The alarm can go off, just be prepared, okay? Not a problem. 
So go through hallways, go into class, alarm goes off, all right, I'll jump for a second, collect myself, walk out the door, go outside, oh, so-and-so's over there, let's go talk to him or her for the next five, ten minutes till we get the all clear. But my teachers did all that. Everything that was in that IEP plan, they stuck to it. They didn't take shortcuts. If something didn't work, all right, we're going to call the parents. We're going to have a meeting. We're going to see what we can do to get something that will work. All right, continue to push, continue to push. And that's what my parents did. That's why I was so successful in, in my school system, because they had a meeting with my teachers. And I couldn't deal with change really well. So what, what else was my, part of my IEP plan? I got to go into my new teacher's classroom two weeks before school started and get used to the environment. Anthony, here's your desk. I'm Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. This is where all the paper is. This is where the pencils, the crayons, and the markers, and the painting are at. Welcome to my classroom. That was part of my plan, and it worked. Because now the first day of school, nobody knows what they're going into, but I do. So I'm good to go. I'm ready to go. I met my teacher. I met my new environment. I'm good to go. I had, I had accommodations from middle school to high school all the way through college. Those accommodations for my tests were extended time on my tests. I had a reader for my test because there would be words, sentences, or phrases on the test I wouldn't understand really well and I'd get confused by. I would take my test in a separate room because if we all took a test right here and now, I could not keep focus. It would be too much for me. I would be more worried about what's going on in the back, what's that person in the front doing right here and now. So having that enclosed environment by myself with my reader, it helped me keep focus right there and then. I had speech therapists twice a week when I was in kindergarten all the way to my junior in high school. And what my speech therapist did, she kind of knew my family history of being athletes. So she made our sessions competitive by playing board games. But here was the catch, though. You could roll the dice. You could roll it on four. You're not moving up four spots until you get the right noun, verb, idiom, or sentence right. So I can't even tell you how many fits I threw after losing a game of Candyland because I couldn't get the right <laughs> noun, verb, or idiom right. But it worked because I learned from my mistakes. And my speech therapist found new creative ways to help me with the language. But it wasn't just them, it was all my teachers. They did all that. I had teachers, folks, who were high school coaches. And those coaches sacrificed 45 minutes of their own practice to help me learn, to help me study. Half the time, they never went to practice. One of the coaches, one of my teachers actually told the assistant coach, hey, helping my student today is a little bit more important than running my own team. That's how much my teachers cared. That much, that's how much they want to be part of something special. They were and they still are to this day. I'm indebted, folks, to over 40 to 50 people. That's how many teachers I've had in my life. I'm indebted to all of them. I don't know how I'm going to repay them. I really don't. A lot of people say to me, well, what you do now as an advocate for the autism community, what you do for anti-bullying as a motivational speaker, that's payment enough. Yes, but no, it's not. I want to do more like my teachers did more for me. Somehow, some way, I'm going to throw my teachers in the biggest party this century will ever see in here because I want them to be acknowledged. I want to celebrate their accomplishments like they celebrated mine. You know, not afraid to say this. I'm a big Boy Meets World fan. All right? I love, I love watching TGIF. You know, Boy Meets World, Family Matters, Full House. But Boy Meets World was always my favorite. Here's why. My favorite TV character of all time is Mr. Feeney. Mr. Feeney was one of the wisest characters I've ever seen on TV. He had such good things to say. And then I look at my, go back in my life and I'm like, you know what? I do have 40 Mr. Feenies in my life right now. And so whenever I get the day off from work, I go back to my middle school. First person I go see is Mr. Hopper, my U.S. history teacher, because we have a long history. Our history started when I was in sixth grade. He was a substitute teacher in our gym class. And six months later, he's my history teacher. Anytime I go back, I walk in his room, he'll say to me, what are you doing here? Go home. I have nothing left to teach you. And I said to him, well, I know you're being sarcastic right now because I can catch that. But two, you do have a lot to teach me. You're still teaching me about life. Because like you, I deal with students and administrators all the time. And you're helping me with that. So you're always going to be there to teach me about whatever. Now there's one more group that will support individuals throughout their lives as well. And that's coaches. Now, most of the questions I get asked all the time whenever I'm out traveling is, how tall are you? Six foot nine. The other one is, you must have played basketball, huh? I'll joke with people and say, no, I actually am in the lacrosse team. I play goalie. But I, get, I, I joke with people all the time about that because obviously you don't see a six foot nine lacrosse player, six foot nine soccer player in the world to these days. But the other question I get asked is, Mr. Ianni, what's he like? What was he like to play for? 
And the he I'm referring to is Tom Izzo. Now, Tom Izzo, folks, is without question one of the greatest individuals I've ever met in my life. But as a coach, he's so intense. He's in your face all the time, yelling, screaming at you, breaking clipboards over his lap. He's so intense as a coach because he wants his teams to be perfect. He wants you to be perfect in running the offense. He wants you to be perfect playing defense. He wants you to be perfect in rebounding, communicating, everything. He wants you to be perfect in all assets of the game. Now, that's why he's won so many championships. That's why he's been to so many Final Fours. Has a national title because he wants you to be perfect. But that's Tom Izzo, the basketball coach. Tom Izzo, the man, other than my own father, is without question one of the greatest individuals that I know in my life. I can't even begin to describe and tell you how many things he puts before himself in life. He puts an entire university of staff, faculty, administration, and students before himself every day. He'd do anything for Michigan State University. He puts an entire basketball program of coaches, managers, current players, and past players before himself. He's told guys who go to the NBA early, I'm not going to stop you from going because you're good enough, but here's the deal. If you go pro, you got to promise me you're going to get your degree somehow, some way. Because your degree will last a lifetime. The money in the NBA will not always be there. But that little piece of paper called your degree is going to last a lifetime. He's told guys like me, who don't go pro, go make an impact in your community. And that's what I did. That's the challenge he laid down for me, and I accepted it. But he's also saved lives as well. He saved my life one time. In October of 2010, the start of my second year at Michigan State, I was at a study table. I was working on a paper, got done, logged off, I'm about to walk out of the academic building. My father gave me, my father called me. He said, Anthony, you got to go home right now. I said, why? What's up? He said, just go home. Your mom will explain what's going on. I'm at your grandma's right now. Just go home. I was like, all right, fine. So I got in my car, drove five, six minutes to my house. It's how far my parents live from campus. And I said to myself, all right, by the way my dad's tone in his voice was, somebody had passed away today. Somebody in the family just died. And the first thought was my grandmother. Because my dad has said to me, I'm at your grandma's right now. I'll talk to you later. So my initial thought was, okay, Grandma passed away today, so Mom's going to tell me how she died, when she died. Just So I was ready for all that. I was not even close to being prepared for what my mom was about to tell me. She walked to the door. She said, son, you might want to sit down. I said, Mom, I'm not going to sit down. So I've been waiting here for 20 minutes. I've been trying to call and text everybody in the family. Nobody's responding. They just, just give it to me straight. What's going on? She said, well, Anthony, your uncle, who was also my godfather, said, Anthony, your uncle was shot and killed at his house this morning. He was murdered. I lost him. I lost it. I dropped to the floor. I didn't stay home for five minutes. Grabbed my keys, ran out the door, got my car, and I drove around the entire town of East Lansing, Michigan for over two hours. I took main roads, back roads, side roads. I took the highway. If you've ever been to East Lansing, Michigan, and you name the road, I took it. And all I kept doing for two hours straight was just screaming at the top of my lungs, screaming, who would do this to us? Who would do this to me? Who would take an innocent life away from me and my family? An innocent life who's been nothing but good and kind to others. An innocent life who's done nothing but busted his butt in life and earned what he got in life because of hard work. You know what? I hope that gunman comes to my front, front apartment door tonight. The points that I got on my forehead, I'm not going to be afraid of them because I'll give them a piece of my mind. Before my uncle died, folks, these were my priorities. Faith, family, school, basketball. Because you're called a student athlete for a reason. A student comes before athlete, right? After my uncle's funeral, these became my priorities. Faith and family, basketball, and school. Because I treated all my teammates and my coaches like family. And I was so overprotective of everybody after that. Because I didn't want anything like that to happen to me ever again. March 1st, 2011, we had a team meeting the night before our finals. Now, how do I remember this day in particular? Pretty simple. It's the same day that President Obama had gone on national television and had announced we had killed Osama bin Laden. That's how I remember this day very well. So before all that went down, we had a team meeting. Coach Izzo walked in, he's firing us up about finals, telling us to finish strong and then we'll come back for spring and summer classes and workouts. We're going to put this thing back to where it was. Because we didn't have a good season that year at Michigan State. We barely made the tournament. We were 19 and 15. So he was really fired up about starting a new league, a new term. So... He called some guys out about their grades. Now, he didn't call them out to be mean about it. He called them out to fire them up. Get them fired up, get them, get them excited. He got to me. I didn't take it that way. So what did I do? I stood up from my chair, and I cussed out our Hall of Fame coach in front of the whole team. 
I threw every single swear word known to mankind at him that night. And I was yelling at him, I was pointing at him, and Draymond Green, my teammate, who were who plays with Golden State Warriors now, he looked at me and said, dude, what are you doing? Do you want to be on this team? Heck, do you want to walk out of here alive tonight? What are you doing? Like, why? After I got done with my rant, Coach Izzo gave me the evilest look. I've never seen a person give me in my entire lifetime. He looked at me and said, don't you ever talk to me like that again. You mean my office right now. Meeting's over, I walked in his office, I sat down, he walked in, he slammed the door, he's eyeing me down, he's walking to his desk, he sits down, and I started crying. I lost it. Now, I've never done this before. I've cried in front of a coach before after losing a big game, but as far as like my personal life went, I've never done that in front of a coach. First time ever. And I said to him, Coach Izzo, oh, oh my God, I'm so sorry, man. Like, I really don't know what's come over me. I don't. Like, ever since my uncle was killed, like, I feel like my entire life has been spiraling out of control. And here's the thing, like, I don't know what to do anymore. Like, physically I'm here, but me mentally I'm checked out. Like, I have no purpose. I have no motivation, and I don't know what to do. I need to find it. Here's the crazy thing. I don't want to talk to anybody else about this. I don't want to talk to my family, my friends, or my teammates. But I don't want to talk to anybody about it. I'm desperate right now. I just need help. Like, I'll do anything for it. Anything. So he got up out of his chair, dragged his chair over next to me, sat down, put his arm around me, brought me in and said, Anthony, here's the deal. I know what you got to do. You know what you got to do. I know what was said about you when you're five years old. I know what those doctors and experts said about you. I know all that. So here's what's going to happen. You're not going to be here in a month. You won't even make it out of Michigan State in three weeks. You'll be gone after next week because of everything that's just happened. So you know what's going to happen? You'll come back for football and basketball games. You're going to walk the streets of East Lansing, Michigan, and all those doubters and haters that said you couldn't do this, they're going to spot you from afar during those football and basketball games, and they are going to scream at the top of their lungs to everybody in East Lansing, hey, look, there goes Anthony Ianni. We were right about the guy. He's a loser. He couldn't do it. We were right. That's where you're heading. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to walk out of this office tonight with a mindset you haven't had in forever. Because, Anthony, I want you to be hungrier for success than you've been in your entire lifetime. Academics, I want you to have the greatest year academically in your whole life. Basketball, despite everything that's happened, I'm naming you captain of our scout team next year. You're the captain of the scout team. You're in charge of all that. And you know what? I need you to help us lead. I need you to help Draymond and Austin lead this team next year. May 5th, 2012, that's your graduation day. I already looked it up. It's going to be right here at the Breslin Center. And you know what's going to happen? The day you walk across that stage, get your diploma, and you walk down a set of stairs, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be somebody at the end of those stairs waiting for you to shake your hand, give you a hug, and say, I'm so proud of you, you did it. You know who that person's going to be? It's going to be me. But I can't do all that. you got to do the rest. Okay? So go do it. I walked out of his office that night with a mindset I haven't had in forever. I was hungrier to prove people wrong and prove people that I could do this. I had one of the greatest years academically in my entire life. Basketball, we were 28 and 8, Big Ten, Big Ten champs, number one seed in the West. Lost in the Sweet 16, but you know what? Me and my seniors, me and my senior comrades, if you will, we helped put Michigan State back on the map where it rightfully belongs, along with the best programs in the country after that. My graduation day finally arrived. Got to the Breslin Center. Walked around the arena, looked at all the banners, championship banners and teams I was a part of, just reflecting on the memories. And I walk across the stage. I get my diploma. Here was the catch, though. It really wasn't my diploma because when I opened it up, there was a note inside saying, your actual diploma will be mailed to you on this day, at this time, to this address. Congratulations, go green. And I'm, I'm walking across the stage, and I'm like, I got it. Oh, that put a damper on things. Man, I need two more weeks for this. But I got to the end of the stage. I walked down the stairs, and there was somebody there waiting for me, who shook my hand, gave me the biggest hug anybody's ever given me to this day, and says to me, I'm so proud of you. You did it. And who was that person? It was Tom Izzo. He kept his promise. He saved my life. You know, folks, I've always told people that, you know, there are the Coach K's of the world, Roy Williams, John Beeline at Michigan, who I highly respect, and that's a big rival of ours. But you know what, there's only one Tom Izzo. And not only is, in my opinion, is Tom Izzo one of the greatest coaches in the world, not only is he a true Hall of Famer, but Tom Izzo is without question one of the greatest individuals that I know in my life. So hard work, motivation, and support are the three keys for a person to be successful in life. Now,
couple notes here before I conclude. Um, first of all, I will take questions after I conclude here. Um, just FYI, you may ask me whatever the heck you want. All right? No question is too personal. You may ask me about anything, my diagnosis, coping mechanisms, my IEP meetings. Whatever you guys want to ask me, you can throw it at me, and I will be gladly to answer it. Um, and second of all, I talked about the anti-bullying stuff that I do. Um, so I started anti-bullying initiative five years ago called the Relentless Tour. Now, the Relentless Tour is mainly for anti-bullying and autism awareness. It's through my story growing up with autism and overcoming bullying, too, because I was bullied a lot because of my autism and because of, you know, when I was 11 years old, I was 6 feet tall and also wore a size 13 shoe because of my height. So, but I started this five years ago, and it's a big nationwide anti-bullying initiative now. Last year alone, we went to over 215 schools and had impacted over 85,000 individuals in Michigan and in the country as well. Um, and then I'm going home tonight, and I'm turning right around and taking a 7 a.m. flight to go to Nebraska for four days to do a relentless tour out there that I partnered up with a foundation to do, where after this year, we, have got, we will have gone to over 40 schools and impacted 20,000 students in central Nebraska. So I'm proud of the work that I do with that. So if anybody is interested in looking into that, uh, the website is www.relentlesstour, relentlesstour.com. Um, a lot of great stuff on there. My info, my contact info is on there. So anything you guys ever need, just give me a buzz. Um, but on a final note here, you know, when I started my speaking career over six years ago, you know, I was getting a lot of advice, a lot of input from people. And the one thing that a lot of people gave me as far as advice, they said, well, you need a motto. You need something that people will remember you by. Whether it's a word, a sentence, or a phrase, you just need a motto. So the motto I came up with was, uh, was live your dreams. Now, when I used the Live Your Dreams model, a lot of students loved it. They got behind it, but then as a couple years went by, it started losing the edge a little bit, started losing steam. So I said, all right, I need to come up with something different, come up with something new. So my former teammate of mine, who works for a production company in Detroit, does all sorts of car commercials and Nike commercials, he was like, I want to do a short mini documentary on you. So it's like a two-minute video. It's actually on the Relentless Tour website, so check it out. So toward the end of the video, when I saw the product, there was a quote I said there at the end, and I probably hit play and rewind about 20 times to listen to this quote over and over. And I said to myself, you know what? I got it. I got my new motto. I know what I'm going to go with now. And here it is. If anybody in this room, anybody that you know in your life, has a dream or has a goal in life, you need to be relentless and attack your dreams and goals in life. You don't let those goals come to you, you got to go get them. Because I'll be honest, ladies and gentlemen, if we just sit in a chair every day hoping that our dreams and our goals will come to us, that's not going to happen. That will never happen. That's called being lazy in life. That's the lazy approach. Don't go, the lazy, don't go with the lazy approach. Get up and be relentless and go attack your dreams and goals in life. And be relentless in everything that you do in your life, folks. Be relentless when you go to sleep, when you wake up, when you go to work, when you go teach. Whatever you guys do, whatever you go, wherever you go in life, be relentless in everything that you guys do in your life. Because I'll be completely honest with everybody in this room. Be relentless and go get your dreams and goals in life. Because at the end of the day, we don't dream our lives. At the end of the day, we live them. Thank you all so much. Greatly appreciate it. God bless all of you. Thank you very much.